So we'll um, just take a minute and revive our motivation. <clears throat> Sange chudam soge chunam na janchu padu dani capsuchi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki rola penchi sange drupa sho sange chudam soge chunam na janchu padu dani capsuchi Dagi chanyan ki pe sonam ki Drola penche sange drupa sho sange churon sogi chunam la Janchu padu dani kapsuchi Dagi chanyan ki pe sonam ki Drola penche sange drupa sho Letting that connect. Okay, so this session, I thought I would go through some bits and pieces about Vajrasattva specifically, um, and then we do a little bit of practice at the end. So the for, before I get into that, I just want to check if you guys had any follow-up questions about the four opponent powers. Are they feeling pretty clear? You feel oriented to those? Like you could walk yourself through them all by yourself? Relatively, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. So um, some bits and pieces about Vajrasattva. Hmm. Okay, so we're looking at the Kriya Tantra version of Vajrasattva, which is one face, two arms, uh, holding Vajra and Bell. There are other forms of Vajrasattva um, in various sadhanas, and they're all perfect oneness. Um, this just happens to be the one we're looking at for this retreat. So the Vajra and the bell are the main implements that we're looking at. And the question is, what is a Vajra and bell? What do they symbolize? Why is he holding them in this context? Um, and it's also good to just kind of flesh out what are a Vajra and bell anyway in general. So um, according to the esoteric inner tantra, the Vajra in his right hand means the ultimate eternal Vajra, the supremely skillful means. The upper five prongs are the five male Buddhas of the five directions, and the lower five prongs are the five female Buddhas of the five directions. This is the five Buddha families that we're talking about. The upper and lower lotus leaves, uh, leaves um, symbolize the bodhisattvas, male and female. The bead garland corresponds to the peaceful deities. The center grip is the unsurpassed Dharmadhatu palace, which is free from all conceptual fabrications. So some of that's going to make sense right away, and some of that will need time and further empowerments to elaborate on. But if you think that those um, prongs at the top and the prongs at the bottom are related to the five Buddha families, their male aspect and female aspect, and that skillful means is emphasized by the Vajra in the right hand, that's the main thing there. So then also based on the esoteric inner tantra, the bell in his left hand represents supreme wisdom. So the upper part of the bell has a face of the female Buddha freedom of, Vaj of the Vajradhatu. <clears throat> Here's the face. The Vajra, the, or the half Vajra on top of the bell up here signifies the union of bliss and emptiness or method and wisdom. The eight lotuses on the bell have eight seed syllables, respectively, which indicate all the female and ma uh, female Buddhas and female Bodhisattvas, except the female Buddha freedom of the Vajradhatu, because she's up here. So we're talking about these petals around the upper part of the bell. The half necklace and the two circles vertically and horizontally arranged Vajras, these um, embellishments here, represent the supremely skillful means to ornament the supreme wisdom. Sometimes some bells have om, ah, and whom on the inner surface up inside to represent the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha. The bell clapper is said to be the source of great bliss or the obtainable wisdom. The round space inside the bell stands for the emptiness of the Dharmadhatu, which is free from all conceptualizations. So the simple way to understand this is 
the right Vajra male method. Right Vajra male method. Left female uh, bell wisdom. Left female bell wisdom. Yeah. So when you see people hold the Vajra, it's indicating method and skillful means. When you see people ring the bell, think the wisdom realizing emptiness. So, you know, that's kind of the simple way of understanding the Vajra and bell, but those elaborated explanations are nice to dig into as well. So related to Vajra Sattva or just in general, have you had questions about Vajras and bells in the past that um, you wanted to check in about? Yes, I go to many pujas, and um, I never know why they're ringing the bell when they are ringing the bell. Um, and there are so many mudras that are involved with the bell and the vajra. Um, I really don't know anything about it after 10 years. Mm. <clears throat> so use of the vajra and bell is only for people who have uh, tantric empowerment, right? T highest tantra? Well, in pujas, that's usually the case, but actually lower tantra practitioners have their own set of mudras and can also use Vajra and Bell. Okay. Yeah, um, and actually, um, technically in the tantras, because lower tantra is, quote, external tantra, they should be used more often, whereas highest yoga tantra, are, it's more optional. But strangely, it's reversed at Dharma centers. And it's like the highest yoga practitioners are the only ones that crack out their implements. And the lower tantra practitioners don't even know that they're allowed to or what to do with them. So that's what winds up happening, right? <laughs> Which is exactly. Sort of yeah. So the lower tantra mudras and the higher tantra mudras are different. That's the first thing to know. Um, they indicate similar things, however. So the various hand gestures that you'll see people do with their Vajra and Bell are indicating offerings of water for drinking, water for bathing, flowers, incense, lamps, perfume, food, and music. The traditional offerings um, from ancient India that you would give a VIP. So who's the VIP? The Buddha is the VIP, <laughs> right? So we're offering all of the beautiful things to the most important guests that we're inviting to the puja. Now, of course, the Buddha doesn't need to be invited, he's already there. And the Buddha doesn't need offerings, he's already satisfied. We do it in order to create the cause for resources in the future, in order to create receptivity between ourselves and the Buddha, and also to, to create this atmosphere of sacredness that what we're doing now is important. So we're pulling out all the stops like that. Now with all of these, outer offerings that are often depicted also on the altar, like with the water bowls. There's often offering bowls that go together with the mudras. There are layers of meaning. So it's not just beautiful things are being offered to VIPs, it's representative of different practices. So it also is a way to tame uh, our various senses that are attached to those objects. So there's layers and layers of meaning with offerings and layers and layers of meaning with use of Vajra and Bell. But if you can kind of keep it simple and think, okay, at pujas, if I hear the bell, I'm to remember it is empty of inherent existence or it is an offering of music or both, <laughs> right? So um, in the puja, it might seem like, how do they know when to ring the bell? How do they know when to show the vajra? Sometimes there's a little icon in the pujas that seem to be indicating something. Sometimes they just magically seem to know. How do they know? Um, these are things that are taught. They don't just magically know. Yeah, so for example, whenever there is an invocation verse in a prayer or a puja, at your, it's good to offer incense. So if you're in a puja, you might just think halfway in a practice randomly, some person stands up and lights some incense, waves it around and puts it in the thing. And you think, why did that happen just then? But it was because probably it was an invocation verse, you know, and at the end of such a verse, there's going to be a ringing of the bell to remind ourselves that that is all empty of inherent existence. Yeah. So you start to learn these things um, mostly you know, in our tradition, you learn them usually during retreats, 
like long retreats, like a month long retreat where uh, in between sessions, you can ask the retreat leader, hey, can we do a session on learning the mudras? Hey, can we do a session on this puja? And you've got so much space and time that you have time to practice and be not graceful and clunky and drop things and, you know, ask your questions. But it's not that you have to learn the mudras in those contexts. You can also just request, can we do a class on mudras and the use of them in pujas? Just request your Dharma Center or request one of your favorite teachers to do a little session on it. So if you're not um, coming across opportunities for longer retreat, then just, you know, be proactive. Sometimes they can even happen casually, like before a puja or after a puja. You can ask a senior student to just show you a couple of things, you know, quietly to the side. Um, but it's probably not the sort of thing that will be advertised or obvious because it is related to Tantra. So that's probably why you haven't come across it, even though you've been at Dharma centers a long time. It's a quiet kind of secret squirrel <laughs> back conversation, even though there's nothing dodgy. It's because these things are so easily misunderstood. They're kept quite private. Um, The bigger picture of that is that, you know, we in ancient times might have to travel hundreds of miles on camel or donkey to come across the teachings that we want to have and ask the teacher multiple times. And, you know, some of the obstacles seem logistical. They are logistical and they're karmic because some of us just stumble in and everything is given to us. And we're kind of like, how did this happen? And then you realize that wasn't the case for everyone. It's not that you're special, it's that you created the cause for it, if that's been the case for you. But for lots of people, it's not the case that you just kind of stumble in and all the information is given to you beautifully organized right at your feet. You have to really make it happen. And part of making it happen is requesting. And if you're not getting the answer you want from one place, check another place. And the good news is, is that a lot of these things are available as texts you can study yourself now translated in English, but it's best to do it in tandem with other senior students. So a part of why I'm, uh, you know, just did this two month course on the power of mantra is knowing that there is that need to unpack Tantra because it's so intrinsic to Tibetan Buddhism. So if you like this topic, um, remind your fellow Dharma students and Dharma centers that this new book is out by Lama Zopa Rinpoche and that the classic Lama Yeshi book, Intro to Tantra, is actually very experiential. It sounds intro to Tantra like it's going to be like a Vajra is this and a bell is that, and it will be that. But it's also very experiential about what is the essence of what it's like to practice Tantra and how can you start even as a beginner. So these texts are out there. It's just kind of hard to know which ones you should start with and that kind of stuff. Ask, yeah, ask people you have connections with. I want to learn Tantra. What's your reading list? You know, and um, all these resources will be made available to you on the internet. So I will send you the whole Dropbox of things, which is pretty much all your classic Kriya Tantra stuff. Um, and that book is amazing with this. Venerable Amy did a how to do mudras for people with highest yoga tantra, and it's really excellent video. But the reasons why shouldn't be put up publicly. So that there's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, the basic stuff like why hide water for washing, water for drinking, flowers, incense, perfume, food, and music, there isn't a reason to hide that. What I'm saying is that's only the surface reason why we do it. I'm not telling you guys the other layers of reasons because it's a mixed group and I don't know who has empowerments and who doesn't. So what I would do is I would see, is there a way to have a study group of senior students or people with all the same empowerment. Um, I know it's frustrating, but we kind of have to make it happen. And it might wind up being online. It might not be based at one center. It might be something that you kind of put out to a group of people and just word of mouth, it gradually builds and it becomes like a book club. Um, I have some friends in Australia doing something like that. And what they do is they meet and discuss this text every week, but then every couple months, they ask me to come and sort out any questions that they couldn't sort out themselves using the text. 
you know, so you could reach out to a senior member of the Sangha or one of your teachers and say, I don't want to put pressure on you to organize a whole course, but we're going to look at this book. Would you come weigh in every now and then and help us get sorted out with the questions we are stuck on? Yeah. So yes, I sympathize <laughs> and, um, you know, just uh, do your best. And also purification sometimes means that things happen more easily too. Yeah. Yeah. Any other Dorje and Bell type questions before we keep going with Vajrasattva? Yeah, Eleanor, go ahead. Um, 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 the question is with the, with the, um, the Dorje, is there an ups upside down ones? I guess yeah. females down below. Yes, yep. as chance would have it. Okay. Um, yep. <laughs> you can um, you can tell which is top and which is bottom in a vajra because one of the points is just slightly longer, and that right. is. The, and if for some reason whoever made your vajra made them perfectly even, then you just wrap a little piece of string around one end yep. and decide on the top. I was just worried if the string gets lost. Yeah, yeah. it's not the end of the world. It's symbolic anyway. No. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Then um, there's all sorts of things on Vajrasattva. And often people ask, like, why the crown? Why the scarves? Why the bracelets? Why the anklets? Is this just Indian art? And it's Indian art that represents something very important. So what it represents is the 13 Sambhogakaya adornments, which signify empathy for sentient beings through great compassion. They also represent the ability to manifest what is pure and beautiful without the need for pacifying the five desires. So they're transforming the energy that accompanies them. Lama Yeshi says, since people from different countries have their own ideas about what ornaments are beautiful, you might not like the way I describe those adorning Vajrasattva. Perhaps you'd like to visualize their ornaments in a way more attractive to your tastes. But the ornaments symbolize particular inner realizations and should therefore be visualized as described in the text. Certainly you should not leave them out just because you think they are too complicated to visualize. So that's not to say that you're doing anything wrong if you can't get your brain to remember all of these details. It's if you're able to visualize and you decide not to. Yeah. So the clarity and the detail of your visualization is going to be based on merit and familiarity. Merit and familiarity. So familiarity, we already have so much kind of understanding of because you can visualize incredible detail if you were to think about, I don't know, your cutlery drawer in your house. Yeah. Like if you think of the cutlery drawer in your house, you can think the spoons are there, they have these kind of handles, the forks are there, they have these kind of handles, the chopsticks are here, the knives are here, you know, the tea spoons are there. You, you can visualize a lot of detail. You can even hear what your drawer sounds like when you pull it open, your particular cutlery drawer. Can you kind of visualize, visualize, um, imagine the sound that it makes? Because it's so familiar. How many times a day do you open that drawer? So we think we can't visualize detail, but actually right now in your mind's eye, you can think of a great deal of detail. Or the face of someone you really love, you could bring up into your mind's eye, all sorts of detail. So with Vajrasattva, we just haven't seen it enough for it to stay, but also we haven't had enough merit for it to stay. So you just do your best, you know, one face, two arms, Vajra position, left hand bell, right hand Vajra, Okay, ornaments. Can I now add ornaments and have them stick? And with some practice, you can. And there's a purifying aspect to visualizing as written, but there's also a, a really excellent concentration tool there. Holding your mind on all those details really develops your focus. So it's got uh, an immediate benefit of helping you with your focus and also a long-term benefit with the purification and connection with the deity. So that's the proviso before I tell you what all the bits mean. Okay, so spreading them out. The five silken garments correspond to the conquest of the five afflictive emotions. So the five silken garments are the headband, the upper garment, the long scarf, the belt, and the lower garment. So they're on um, your left. So we have <clears throat> headband representing attachment is, con is conquered. 
upper garment attachment is conquered, scarf aversion is conquered, belt pride is conquered, lower garment jealousy is conquered. So that's the same five as we were looking at with 35 Buddhas and the way they were arranged in rows, right? That same group of five is going to keep showing up again and again. And then we have the eight jeweled ornaments denote the eightfold noble path, which is common to all forms of Buddhism. So the crown represents right view, earrings denote right thought, short necklace denotes right speech, armlets denote right conduct, two longer necklaces, right livelihood, bracelet on each wrist, right effort, anklets on each foot, right mindfulness, rings on each foot, right concentration. So when you see those ornaments and all of that adornment, think this is representative of the path that I'm on and it embodies and encompasses it. It's also kind of like a mind map to help you remember some of these lists. So, you know, there's a lot of lists in Buddhism. And so sometimes having an image to plug it into helps anchor it. So there he is. Um, the meaning of his features in general, the knot of top, uh, the knot of hair on the top, symbolizes that he has never been confused or distracted, and his continuum has always been full of great wisdom. His singular face represents the sole heart drop of the ultimate Dharmakaya. Soul means everything is included in it. Heart drops can fall into two categories: ultimate and conventional. The ultimate refers to the Dharmakaya. His two eyes represent the wisdom of suchness and omniscience. The wisdom of suchness is to realize the nature of all phenomena as emptiness. The wisdom of omniscience is to understand all phenomena. His two ears are the union of the two truths, conventional truth and ultimate truth. Two nostrils represent benefiting self and others effortlessly. Lips symbolize universal great happiness. The teeth represent the perfect mandala of the 42 peaceful deities, and the tongue signifies the union of samsara and nirvana. His two arms show the equality of wisdom and compassion. The 10 fingers represent the five Buddha bodies and five wisdoms. Two feet symbolize not abiding in either samsara or nirvana. The 12 joints of his body represent the purification of the transmigration through the 12 links of dependent origination. His 10 toes represent the five perfect male Buddhas and the five perfect female Buddhas of the five directions. Sitting in the Vajra posture signifies being free from the drifting and changing nature of the three times. His complete body represents the enlightened body with all the good qualities. The wisdom rays radiating from his pores denote the 84,000 teachings. So that is Vajrasattva's iconography in a nutshell. Um, if you want to purify all of the negative karma you have done in this life, a three-month Vajrasattva retreat will do the trick. <laughs> so it's 100,000 uh, Vajrasattva mantras. So if you ever have a chance to do a three-month retreat, it's really worthwhile. Um, Marla, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a question. The images that you're using in your uh, um, presentation, your slides are, are really, really beautiful ones. Are they available somewhere? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll send you the PowerPoint slides, but um, I've harvested them from a couple different places. Mainly the Vajrasattva ones are from um, a, a book that is maybe three or four years old called um, Vajrasattva Meditation, and it's by uh, Lama Punsok. Um, Yeshi Punsok, I think, Lama Yeshi Punsok, but it's uh, listed in the PowerPoint in the colophon at the end, so you'll be able to track it there. So okay. there's those images and more. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. One more, one more round of 35 Buddhas today, and then no more 35 Buddhas today. Let's do one more round. We'll do the short version of saying the mantra or saying the names one time each. And now you've been introduced to all 35 of them and the medicine Buddhas. Really try and make a strong connection if you can. Okay, so up we go. At least two palms together.
renew your bodhicitta. Chandente de Jinje Padra, Jampayan, Dapa Sope, Sange, Rinchin Gatsola, Chata, Chandente de Jinje Padra, Jampayan, Dapa Sope, Sange, Rinchin Gatsola, Chata, Chandente de Jinje Padra, Jampayan, Dapa Sope, Sange, Rinchin Gatsola, Chata, Chandente de Jinje Padra, Jampayan. Dapa so pe sange rinchin gatsola chata. Chamden te de jinje padra jambaya. Dapa so pe sange rinchin gatsola chata. Chamden te de jinje padra jambaya. Dapa so pe sange rinchin gatsola chata. Chamden te de jinje padra jambaya. Dapa so pe sange rinchin gatsola chata. Om Namo Bhagavate Red Nuketu Ratsaya Tatagatai Ahate Samyak Sam Buddhaya Tayat Om Ratni Ratni Maha Ratni Ratna Bitsaye Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Red Nuketu Ratsaya Tatagatai Ahate Samyak Sam Buddhaya Tayata Om Ratni Ratni Maha Ratni Ratna Bitsaye Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Renu Ketu Pratsaya Tata Gautai Ahate Samyak Sam Buddhaya Tayata Om Ratne Ratne Maha Ratne Ratna Vitsaye Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Renu Ketu Pratsaya Tata Gautai Ahate Samyak Sam Buddhaya Tayata Om Ratne Ratne Maha Ratne Ratna Vitsaye Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Renu Ketu Ratsaya Tata Gautaya Ahate Samyak Sam Buddhaya Tayata Om Ratne Ratne Maha Ratne Ratna Vitsaya Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Renu Ketu Ratsaya Tata Gautaya Ahate Samyak Sam Buddhaya Tayata Om Ratne Ratne Maha Ratne Ratna Vitsaya Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Renu Ketu Ratsaya Tata Gautaya Ahate Samyak Sam Buddhaya Tayata Om Ratne Ratne Maha Ratne Ratna Vitsaya Soha Om Namo Menju Shri He Namo Su Shri He Namo Om Tama Shri He Soha Om Namo Menju Shri He Namo Su Shri He Namo Om Tama Shri He Soha Om Namo Menju Shri He Namo Su Shri He Namo Om Tama Shri He Soha Homage to the confession of the Bodhisattva's downfalls. I, throughout all times, take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I, throughout all times, take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I, throughout all times, take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. To the founder, Bhagavan Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni Buddha, I prostrate. To Tathagata, thoroughly destroying with Vajra essence, I prostrate. To Tathagata, radiant jewel, I prostrate. To Tathagata, king, lord of the Nagas, I prostrate. To Tathagata, army of heroes, I prostrate. To Tathagata, delighted hero, I prostrate. To Tathagata, jewel fire, I prostrate. To Tathagata, jewel moonlight, I prostrate. Tathagata, meaningful to see, I prostrate. Tathagata, jewel moon, I prostrate. Tathagata, stainless one, I prostrate. Tathagata, bestowed with courage, I prostrate. Tathagata, pure one, I prostrate. Tathagata, bestowed with purity, I prostrate. Tathagata, water god, I prostrate. Tathagata, deity, the water god, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious goodness, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious sandalwood, I prostrate. Tathagata, infinite splendor, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious light, I prostrate. Tathagata, sorrowless glory, I prostrate. 
To Tathagata, son of non-craving, I prostrate. To Tathagata, glorious flower, I prostrate. To Tathagata, pure light rays, clearly knowing by play, I prostrate. To Tathagata, lotus light rays, clearly knowing by play, I prostrate. To Tathagata, glorious wealth, I prostrate. To Tathagata, glorious mindfulness, I prostrate. To Tathagata, glorious name, widely renowned, I prostrate. Tathagata, king holding the victory banner of Foma's power, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious one, totally subduing, I prostrate. Tathagata, I believe, victorious in battle, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious transcendence through subduing, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious manifestations illuminating all, I prostrate. Tathagata, all subduing, jewel lotus, I prostrate. Tathagata, arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, king of the lord of mountains, firmly seated on a jewel and lotus, I prostrate. Tathagata, arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, king of the lord of mountains, firmly seated on a jewel and lotus, I prostrate. Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, king of the Lord of Mountains, firmly seated on a jewel and lotus, I prostrate. The seven medicine Buddhas. To the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, renowned, glorious king of excellent signs, I prostrate. To the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, king of melodious sound, brilliant radiance of skill, adorned with jewels, moon, and lotus, I prostrate. To the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, stainless, excellent gold, illuminating jewel, who accomplishes all conduct, I prostrate. To the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, glorious supreme one, free from sorrow, I prostrate. To the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, melodious ocean of proclaimed Dharma, I prostrate. To the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, clearly knowing by the play of supreme wisdom of an ocean of Dharma, I prostrate. To the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, medicine guru, king of lapis lazuli light, I prostrate. All those, you 35 Buddhas and others, as many Tathagatas, Arhats, perfectly completed Buddhas, as there are existing, sustaining, and residing in all the world systems of the ten. All you Buddha Bhagavans, please pay attention to me. In this life, in all the states of rebirth in which I have circled in samsara throughout beginning of lives, whatever negative actions I have created, made others create or rejoice in the creation of, whatever possessions of stupas, possessions of sangha, or possessions of the sangha of the ten directions that I have appropriated, made others appropriate or rejoice in the appropriation of. Whichever among the five actions of immediate retribution I have done, caused to be done, or rejoiced in the doing of, whichever paths of the ten non-virtuous actions I have engaged in, caused others to engage in, or rejoiced in the engaging in, whatever I have created, being obscured by these karmas, causes me and sentient beings to be born in the hell realms, in the animal realm, in the preda realm, and irreligious as barbarians or as long-life gods with imperfect faculties, holding wrong views, or not being pleased with the Buddha's descent. In the presence of the Buddha Bhagavans, who are transcendental wisdom, who are eyes, who are witnesses, who are and who see with omniscient consciousness, I'm admitting and confessing all these negativities. I will not conceal them nor hide them. And from now on in the future, I will abstain and refrain from committing them again. All Buddha Bhagavans, please pay attention to me. In this life and all other states of rebirth in which I have circled in samsara throughout beginningless life, whatever roots of virtue I've created by generosity, even as little as giving just one mouthful of food to a being born in the animal realm, whatever roots of virtue I've created by guarding morality, whatever roots of virtue I've created by following pure con. Whatever roots of virtue I've created by fully ripening sentient beings, whatever roots of virtue I've created by generating bodhicitta, and whatever roots of virtue I've created by my unsurpassed transcendental wisdom, all these assembled and gathered combined together, I fully dedicate to the unsurpassed, the unexcelled, that higher than the, that superior to the superior. Thus, I completely dedicate to the highest, perfectly complete enlightenment, just as the previous Buddha Bhagavans have fully dedicated, just as the future Buddha Bhagavans will fully dedicate. And just as the presently abiding Buddha Bhagavans are fully dedicating, like that I too dedicate fully. I confess all negative actions individually. I rejoice in all merits. I urge and implore all Buddhas to grant my request. May I receive the highest, most sublime transcendental wisdom. To the conquerors, the best of humans, those who are living in the present time, those who have lived in the past, and those who will likewise to all those who have qualities as vast as an infinite ocean, with hands folded, I approach for refuge. The general confession. Uhula, woe is me. O great Guru, Bajadara, all other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who abide in the ten directions and all the venerable Sangha, please pay attention to me. I, who am named, circling in cyclic existence since beginningless time until the present, 
overpowered by mental afflictions such as attachment, aversion, and ignorance by means of body, speech, and have created the ten non-virtuous actions. I've engaged in the five uninterrupted negative karmas and the five nearing uninterrupted negative karmas. I've transgressed the vows of individual liberation, transgressed the vows of bodhisattva, and transgressed the samaya of secret mantra. I have been disrespectful to my parents, have been disrespectful to my Vajra masters and to my abbot, and have been disrespectful to my spiritual friends living in ordination. I've committed actions harmful to the three jewels, avoided the holy dharma, criticized the Arya Sun, harmed sentient beings, and so on. These and many other non-virtuous negative actions I have done, have caused others to do, have rejoiced in others' doing, and so on. In the presence of the great Guru, Vajadara, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who abide in the Ten Directions and the Venerable Sangha, I admit this entire collection of faults and transgressions that are obstacles to my own higher rebirth and liberation and are causes of cyclic existence in miserable lower realms. I will not conceal them and I accept them as negative. I promise to refrain from doing these actions again in the future. By confessing and acknowledging them, I will attain and abide in happiness, while by not confessing and acknowledging them, true happiness will not come. Think that through the force of reciting these names of the 35 Buddhas of Confession and Medicine Buddhas, through the power of their pure prayers and vows, through the power of generating regret and the other opponent forces, and through the power of having made these prostrations, nectar and light rays descend from the holy bodies of the Buddhas, completely purifying all negative karmas, defilements, and imprints collected on your mental continuum since beginning this time. Generate strong faith that your mind has become completely pure. So go ahead and have a seat. And this, the rest of this session, we're going to experiment with what it's like to do practice right after 35 Buddhas, just gentle shamatha single pointedness. So for the shamatha, if you'd like to use an object rather than the breath, you can think the image of Vajrasattva in the space in front and not having any analytical things, not doing a purification per se, just using Vajrasattva as your meditation image. I'll leave the image up, but don't stare at it too long. Just look at it and then close your eyes and bring it to your mind's eye. And when it starts to get fuzzy and you can't remember the details, you just open your eyes, have a look, close your eyes again, bring it to your mind's eye. So straight into meditation. Back into meditation posture, keeping strong your bodhicitta motivation. Settle the mind on your meditation object, whether the breath or vajrasattva in the space in front, and stabilize.
And when your focus drifts, just take a minute to revive it and restabilize. Catching yourself when you drift, keep coming back to the meditation object.
Keeping your focus vivid without stress, relaxed without sleep. And gradually relax your attention and dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay, so how was doing 10 minutes of shamatha right after having done prostrations? Was it easier, harder? Like, did you feel, yeah, it can be a really good way to launch yourself into your practice. Yeah, so I really recommend it. Um, 10 minutes is plenty. Yeah, don't need to push it more than 10 minutes of shamatha, especially um, if you're new to it. Five minutes even is fine. Um, it's nice to do prostrations, then five minutes shamatha, and then done, or whatever other prayers you were planning to do. But it, it's good to kind of ride the wave of having just done your prostrations, adding shamatha to it. Um, I was just wondering if we um, emanate replicas of ourself out at the beginning, when do we bring them back? Mm, um, bring them, bring them back. Yeah, I think, you know, bring them back whenever it feels natural. But if you haven't brought them back by the time the Buddhas are dissolving into each other and into you, do it then. Yeah, so you could kind of do a full sweep, right? I think that I, I'm just thinking about what I do. And I think that I just kind of naturally let go of that visualization once I get into the prayer part at the end. Yeah, and uh, but I think that that's just kind of what's happened organically. It wasn't like a definitive choice I made. So I think theoretically I could keep all of them emanated and all of us be saying that prayer together and maximize my merit. Perhaps I should start doing that. But um, if nothing else, absorb everybody when the Buddhas are all absorbing and then into you. Super, thank you. Yeah, the, the other way to do that is to think that all sentient beings are prostrating with you rather than you and all of your past lives prostrating, you think you and all sentient beings are prostrating together. And that helps you increase your positive karmic connection with all sentient beings. And it also helps you develop that sense of being the leader and the servant of sentient beings. So if you prefer that way, if you've got the mental space for emanating replicas, you can also think of sentient beings instead. say you've got lots of practices what do you do yeah in any case so if it's something like um, you've got a mantra commitment like a lot of us have kriya tantra lower tantra just the mantra not the whole sadhana commitment say like mm -hmm. green tara and manjushri and quite a few what you can do is you can either break it up or do it back to back but you think okay because of bodhicitta out of emptiness i arise as tara Om Tari Tutari Turi Soa, you do your mala and then absorb 
dedicate for a second. And then because of bodhicitta, out of emptiness, I arise as medicine Buddha. Taya ta om bekenze bekenze ma bekenze bekenze do your round dedicate. So if you're doing back-to-back -back malas, you don't have to do a whole giant preliminary unless you have the um, requirement to or the commitment to. Um, if you have highest yoga tantra, there is a way to merge your six session guru yoga with one of your other highest yoga tantra practices like Yamantaka or Vajrayogini, and they even have sadhanas that built that build that merging in. So if that's the case, um, I can help you with resources. You can send me an email. But um, what what winds up happening, I think, for us that have accumulated a lot of empowerments is we'll do our 35 Buddhas in the morning. We'll sit, we'll do a little bit of shamatha, and then one of the sadhanas. And then up, cup of coffee, have some breakfast, you know, potter around, brush the teeth, whatever, all sort of things that haven't gotten done yet. And then come back and maybe do another session of another sadhana. And then, you know, you have your day, live your life, and then you might have um, a sadhana that you do in the afternoon to kind of like wake up your bodhicitta and reconnect you with your practice. And then you do your evening practice of whatever remains plus vajrasattva. So most of us break up our practice into at least two chunks, the morning chunk and the evening chunk. Sometimes um, people will interject one or two little sessions in the middle of the day if they like breaking it up. So it's muchly about press preference. Yeah, it's mostly about preference if you want to do back to back to back or if you like to break up your practices with space in between. Um, so, you know, they're, they're a joy to do. It's just, they feel like a chore when our attachment gets involved. Practice every day, very important. How that practice gets structured and built, it's your life, you know? 